Our moderator for today is Carla Nunez. Carla is a managing director in the Office of Professional Practice at Kroll, based in Philadelphia. In her OPP role, Carla provides firm-wide technical <coughs> guidance on a variety of valuation, financial reporting, and tax issues. She is also the global leader of Kroll's Valuation Digital Solutions Group, which produces the cost of capital thought leadership content and data. And so with no further ado, uh, thank you, Carla, and over to you. Thanks so much, Richard, and welcome everyone to our session today. I hope that you'll find it useful after spending this 60 minutes with us. Uh, as, as Richard mentioned, I lead our cost of capital group for Kroll, and inflation is one of the key ingredients that we monitor uh, because it, it, it goes directly into cost of capital estimates, and we look at this at it uh, from a variety of countries, geographic regions, trends, etc. And so this has definitely been the topic of the day since the recovery from COVID uh, began. And I am uh, excited to have uh, the panel of experts we have today with us. What I'm going to do is, is so we're going to have Brad Cornell, Alexander Pierantoni, and Patrick Alcoza. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by asking them to say a few words about themselves and also how the, uh, they have been uh, uh, in contact, if you will, so how they uh, have interacted with the topic of inflation. Uh, just to give a little bit of uh, background. I'll start with Brad. Brad, why don't you give us a little bit about uh, your background? Sure. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor of finance at the Anderson Graduate School of Management at UCLA and a founder of the, the Cornell Capital Group. I've been doing work related to inflation and valuation ever since I wrote my PhD dissertation at Stanford in the late 1970s on inflation and interest rates. So it's a topic I'm delighted to talk about. Excellent, uh, we're happy to have you. Alex, uh, on to you. Thank you, Carla. First of all, it's a pleasure to be with IVSC and in this panel. Uh, I lead the corporate finance and emerging acquisitions operations of Crawl here in Latin America. I'm based in Brazil. Uh, I've been living inflation since uh, I was born, right? The region is quite low uh, for it ups and downs. So that's our day to day. Uh, I would say that uh, it's definitely in a different order today, but we have been seeing this in our countries in Latin America for the, the last four years. So that's a very interesting subject to discuss. Excellent. And now on to Patrick. Thank you, Carla. Pleasure to be today with you participating in the webinar. So to everyone, this is Patrick Koza coming from KPMG Lebanon and currently working as a manager with KPMG's financial instruments topic team in London. So coming from the, Lebanon, I had practical experience of hyperinflation that I picked up from the field uh, from the time there. And now as part of the global team, I have a global aspect of inflation after working on matters related to Argentina, Turkey, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, and other hyperinflationary economies, basically. Okay. So now that you know a little bit about ourselves, uh, we'd like to know a little bit about yourself. So as uh, Richard mentioned, we're going to have a, a couple of polling questions. I'm actually going to be showing two polling questions just to know a little bit about yourself because it helps us throughout the discussion. The first one we're going to ask you is in which geographic region you're located. So North America, Latin America, Europe, Middle East, Africa, or Asia Pacific. Let's see the results. So uh, evenly distributed between North America and Europe, uh, we do have some folks from Asia Pacific, Latin America, and other places. So welcome, everyone. We hope our topics are um, to your um, to valuable to you. The second polling question uh, actually is regarding uh, your focus in valuation. So what is the primary asset class in which you work on, uh, either reviewing or doing? So business and intangible valuations, alternative asset investments, real estate, machinery equipment, or other not applicable? And I encourage you to uh, answer even if you're not getting um, CP credits. So 60% uh, is in a business and intangible valuation, um, and then followed by real estate and alternative assets. Okay, great. 
So we thought we would start this session to just setting the stage and, and, and showing some data on what we're seeing today uh, on inflation trends around the globe. And so, um, so we're going to show you just uh, this data is from um, ISS markets. And the reason is because we were able to get aggregates uh, uh, from a certain history until uh, the current time. And current time is just March because some countries uh, report data faster than others and some don't report at all. So this data is from January of uh, 2000 through March 2022. And we realized that there's like some countries that already reported April. And um, this shows you the uh, emerging markets, world and advanced economies, and the trends that we're seeing in inflation in this uh, period. And what we're seeing is that for both the world economy and advanced economies, we're at a record high inflation for this period, so since 2000. Uh, and this is like a monthly inflation. So the way you compute this uh, is like the CPI, the Consumer Price Inflation Index, what it is this month compared to the same month of last year. It, it gives you like a, a pulse for what's happening right now. And you can see that inflation collapsed in COVID, during the COVID period. Um, and as well as in the global financial crisis after some hikes at the beginning of 2008. So um, the next uh, slide is going to show us like a little bit of like, okay, let's look at some of the countries and regions that typically are perceived as having more inflation. And this would actually be, believe it or not, like emerging Europe. And that means like Central and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, the old, uh, you know, not, not the traditional Western Europe that people think about. Um, and uh, the um, Africa, Latin America, and Middle East. And what we're seeing here is emerging Europe uh, is seeing a huge spike, which actually started before uh, the Russia invasion of Ukraine, but that has exacerbated the period because a lot of the countries there are dependent on energy uh, imports from, from Russia. Uh, the next slide shows us um, Latin America. So like just to give a sense of Latin America, and I'm actually showing here. So during this time period, this is a record high for both Latin America and Argentina. So Argentina um, is been suffering with high inflation for now uh, a few years. But in April of 2022, which is not IHS data, it's actually data from their statistical office, it reached 58%. And some economists are saying it will get even higher. Uh, and I'm not including here Venezuela because Venezuela, as you know, has been a hyperinflationary country and you can't even like get like good data from, 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 from that country. Uh, the interesting thing for Brazil here and, you know, for, um, uh, Alexander, for Alex to talk about is that we're at a 18 year record for Brazil. So it's not like a huge record compared to a longer history, but it's still pretty high. And then what is interesting about this um, uh, trend is that now inflation is not uh, just an, a phenomenon that we're seeing in emerging markets we're actually seeing it in developed economies. So we see here USA and Canada, Asia Pacific and Western Europe, uh, and USA and Canada are actually up there, right? Uh, and the latest reading. And so with that, I was just, just gonna focus like what's been happening in some of the major economies around the world. And uh, in this case, the United States, so again, all of this, in order to have the data all for the same month, uh, I'm showing April here. I do have some uh, data there for preliminary May for both Germany and the Eurozone. Uh, and so United States, maybe we're seeing a little bit of, um, you know, a slowdown in the pace at which inflation has been going up. So it was eight and a half percent in March and now it was 8.3. The next reading comes out uh, on Friday, uh, but we're still talking about a 40 year high. Uh, Canada, 31 years, UK, uh, if you go back to statistics uh, uh, that have been recently updated, it seems like a 40 year high. Germany, Germany is, is really um, striking because this latest reading was 31 years ago is like when German um, Western 
and East Germany got reuni reunified in 1990, but preliminary readings for May points that inflation might reach the highest level since 1973-74, so just uh, during that, the global oil crisis uh, of the 70s. That would be almost a half a century ago. So for Germany, a country that had been used to having really low or almost no inflation, this is very striking. And the Eurozone, um, this is the highest reading since the Euro got created. So um, we care not just about, for valuation purposes, the current level inflation, but what it looks like over the long term. So like in your valuation, which, for example, um, Brad is, uh, is going to touch about this, uh, t touch on this, like what you need to care about. So it's not just the, um, uh, you know, next couple of years, but when does it revert, if at all, to a stabilized level so you can incorporate in your terminal year? And what we're seeing here, this is just IHS market uh, forecasts. I don't like to look at just one single uh, source of forecast, but this is just an example. And so over the last, uh, over the next 10 years, this is what it looks like. Um, but, uh, you know, for the most part, IHS, and that's sure that this will be true, thinks that central banks will get inflation under control uh, between next year and 2024. We'll see if that's the case. But what also another observation about these readings is that they're much higher than what they had been for the last, say, 10 years, these long-term inf inflation expectations. And then I'm just going to give you a couple of, like, a flavor for the U.S. and Germany. So U.S. here, what if we don't look just at IHS? What if we look at other sources for long-term inflation? And what we're looking at here is has all these sources is that the median uh, inflation for over the next five to 10 years is 2.7. That's this median here. But what is striking, okay, is that um, just after COVID, that long-term inflation expectation was, was 2%. This is a very large increase, believe it or not, in a, this short period of time. And in Germany, it's uh, even more striking because we were talking about levels of inflation over the long run that economists were expecting of 1.6%, and the median now has risen to 2.6%. And so this is, um, it's 1% increase when countries have low inflation is very significant. So with this as a backdrop, I'm going to stop, um, you know, uh, talking about the, the this background, and I'm going to first start with Brett um, to tell us about, you know, why do we even care about inflation? So what are some of the challenges that analysts may face when they're looking at, say, financial performance for companies uh, in periods of higher inflation? How do you, why do you care about that compared to a period that was uh, low inflation? So Brad, over to you. Thank you, Carla. And let me thought, start with a little uh, thought experiment. Suppose that I give you three years of financial statements to do a evaluation analysis, for example, and you look at them and you find that the first one is in dollars, year one, year two is in euro, and year three is in yen. And you immediately come to me and say, I can't work with these. They're all in different currencies. I have to put them on a constant base, maybe put them all in dollars or all in yen or whatever. Well, exactly the same thing happens when you have inflation. And I think there's an important way to think about this and to think about inflation. Uh, as when Carla presented the data, she talked about inflation in terms of rising prices of goods and services, in terms of price indexes. And that's how we measure it. But that's not what it is. What it is is the decline in the value of one good the unit of account. And I'll use the word dollar because I'm American, but you can substitute any currency you want. And what's happening is a dollar is always worth a dollar. I can take a dollar bill out of my wallet, take it to the bank, and they'll give me another dollar bill. They'll say it's worth a dollar. But in terms of purchasing power, it's been declining. And that's what inflation is not rising prices so much as a decline in the unit of a value, the unit of account, which is experienced as rising prices. Now, the reason I say all this is if you give me three years of financial statements in an inflationary economy, 
they're all measured in different terms. Your $1, your $2, your $3 are all different. So as part of your analysis, just as you'd have to take the euros, yens, and dollars and put them all in a constant currency, in an inflationary environment, you have to take dollars in your one, dollars in your two, and dollars in your three, and put them on a constant basis. And I'd like to, before I by end here, just focus on one more aspect of inflation, which is what I call the three flavors of inflation. And when you do valuation, you need to keep them straight. The first is simply historical inflation. How much has the price index risen over any period of time? And you can measure that directly. However, the term matters. When I say historical inflation, do I mean last month, last year, last five years, et cetera? The second is expected inflation. Now that's forward looking and there's no way to measure it objectively. We can get various estimates, maybe from surveys, maybe from financial markets and so forth. But inflation, expected inflation is particularly important in valuations for reasons we'll talk about uh, coming up. But here, once again, you have a term problem. Do I mean expected inflation next month, next year, next five years, next 20 years? That distinction turns out to be important. And the final thing is unexpected inflation. That is the difference between the inflation that's been realized and what I expected previously. And that's important for two reasons. First, it can be thought of as a measure of risk. If there's unexpected inflation, people don't know what's going to happen. That's a source of risk. And second, it's unexpected inflation that causes people to revise their expectations for inflation, which then has the impact on the financial markets through the changing expected inflation. So when we say inflation, there's a lot covered under that one word. And I can say more about this later. So that was an excellent uh, you know, uh, linkage between the data we saw and wh- how we're gonna use that data into uh, incorporating it into valuation. And, and uh, some of the, the issues are, where is inflation coming from, right? And so some of what that initial um, background did not I- explain is where is inflation coming from, right? And inflation, it varies by countries and regions, but in the case of um, the developed markets, the major economies, it probably was a combination of the recovery from COVID, uh, you know, and the, act, you know, the, a lot of consumers being flushed with cash from the various uh, fiscal uh, 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 stimulus programs that various countries had, the monetary policy that was ultra loose and where interest rates went to the lowest level for many countries, like that lowest level in history. And then now the Russia-Ukraine um, uh, conflict is uh, leading energy prices to really increase. But for Brazil and Latin America, et cetera, um, maybe energy is not so much of an issue. So over the last several decades, Latin America has suffered from high inflation. So these are not the explanations. And we know that Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela actually have hyperinflation some, in some periods of their history. So I was going to ask Alex to share a little bit of his experience uh, and, you know, in working in this kind of environment and tell us, like, do companies and do analysts, professionals, et cetera, go around this and do valuations in real terms so they continue to use the same sort of nominal analysis and how they go about um, taking into account this type of environment? Alex? Thank you. Thank you, Carla. And uh, I have to, to highlight uh, Brad's comments that he definitely paved the way, I would say, for some of for my comments when he raised the point about the purchasing power, right? That's the, the dollar example that he raised. And the second one is about uh, recollection, and I, I, I call it a contracted inflation that we have the, the, in Latin America, not only in Brazil. As I mentioned, uh, inflation has always been an issue uh, for us. I would add inflation to some other variations that we have when we do analysis here, that's foreign exchange, for example, that's another very relevant issue in, in the region that are cost that affect 
costs, revenues, investments in different ways and in different timings. Again, going back to Brad's comment about year one, two or three. So when you uh, presented uh, Germany, UK, uh, US inflation, right, for example, uh, I would say this is uh, unfortunately, right, and Patrick will probably uh, agree with me, familiar for us in Latin America, but that's, that's our day to day. Uh, one thing that worries a lot us here in the region is about this contracted inflation and recollection effect, like double digit uh, numbers. We are facing today in Brazil, for example, LTM more than 12%. Uh, uh, official inflation. If you look on the uh, uh, on the, 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 the index itself, more than seventy percent, eight percent of the the, the the services and products that make the index are trending up. So this is one of the the, the points that uh, we are very worried about when you talk even about contracted and future uh, uh, inflation. So this creates a, 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 a circles environment then triggers also the real interest rates right for brazil today is around 12.75 uh, percent it was six months ago two percent the real inter basic interest rate today we have more than 12 and it's probably going up until the end of the year so but this is the point when i fully agree with brad about the perspectives and how they are going to affect uh, the long term. And this is not only Brazil. If you look, Paraguay has around 12% in LTM, Argentina 58%, as you mentioned, um, Ghana and Chile, that is, uh, used to be a very uh, stable count around 11% in, in LTM. Uh, and this, uh, I, I would add, and just going to, to our point about projections and long term views, that is also affected by internal issues of each country. Right, so we do have logistic challenges. We do have uh, weather challenges when you go for Brazil, for example, uh, in the agribusiness. That's a very relevant sector in the country that affect the whole internal uh, inflation on top of the international one that we know all the the, the main reasons of that. H having said that, uh, I would say and keeping all the, the political issues that also in Latin America four to four years affect all the projections, right? We know that's ups and downs every four years in all this. I would say uh, for, for the, the, the good analysis, Carla, uh, two things about when talking about uh, uh, um, valuations, I would could say. First is uh, I would bold the discounted cash flow analysis. So definitely use multiples, but we have to analyze each company in each of their lines about revenues, costs, investments, working capital investments, and the impact of inflation in working capital. Right? This is very relevant, right, by its own. So we definitely have to use uh, DCF as, as a basic parameter. And second, because what I said about the impact uh, and the terms and timing of inflation, yes, we do uh, continue to use uh, uh, valuation in, in nominal terms, right? Then goes the trigger about which uh, um, uh, indexes we are using. If it's the official one, the 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 the, 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 the indexes that companies are seeing on the day to day, they are very different. Just to give you an example, as I mentioned, LTM LTM inflation in Brazil is around twelve percent. Real one is close to thirty. Right. So this is a big gap. And then you, when you go to hyperinflation and things about that. So uh, uh, having said that, just to, to finalize here, I, I would reinforce about the, 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 the necessity of looking in details on nominal terms and more than only saying nominal, right, about how they impact different ways and in a different timing, uh, costs, revenues, investments, and the, the company numbers. Thanks, Alex. Uh, and uh, it's um, very interesting to get that perspective, uh, you know, and I'm actually going to go one step farther given Patrick's uh, experience with hyperinflationary countries. And recently we have been seeing a turning point with, in which countries that maybe were not hyperinflationary in the past um, are now becoming hyperinflationary at the same time. And so, I wanted to ask Patrick his perspectives. What are some of the root causes causes for that? 
Thank you, Carla. So basically, I can sum up the root causes for the steep rise in inflation to both the war in Ukraine and post-pandemic demand. So these were the two turning points for us witnessing this much uh, that economy is turning into hyperinflationary economies. So what happened is that in early 2022, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to large increases in the price of commodities. That is due to the fact that Russia is a major supplier of oil, gas, and metals, and together with Ukraine of wheat and corn. Therefore, uh, reduced supplies of these commodities have driven their prices up sharply. Moreover, the world has witnessed increased demand after the release of COVID-19 travel restrictions and quarantine requirements. The effect of increased demands and difficulties in importing some goods to many countries has driven up prices too. In other words, uh, countries emerged from lockdowns, shops opened, people were able to go out and buy stuff with money saved during weeks of economic activity. So these two factors explain the large majority of the increase in inflation when benchmarking to previous years. Nevertheless, we can't scope out that uh, as well, many economies used to rely on tourism, which lockdowns uh, have heavily affected those, which leads to inflation and scarcity in foreign currency. And last but not least, I can also add that other political factors can come into play and improper monetary policies set by central banks may be main drivers in increasing inflation in many economies and uh, as witnessed in many other parts of the world. Thanks, Patrick. So uh, now that you have this background of what's going on in terms of, of economic realities, and we have, we're going to move into, well, then how do I take that data, both historical uh, data versus uh, expected or unexpected inflation, and how do we adjust our valuations if we're valuing a business or an intangible asset or, you know, a real estate, um, uh, you know, property, uh, a mall, et cetera. And so I was going to start with, uh, with Brad and asking how does, you know, high or unexpected levels of inflation impact a company's valuation or, or an asset valuation. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was going to say, okay, let's focus first on the discounted cash flow approach. So things like revenue growth, margins, you know, uh, operating, um, you know, costs, future capex needs, so capital expenditures, uh, and where are the areas that you can see typically more internal inconsistencies? So, for example, the terminal year value. It's like, how do you estimate, where do analysts get tripped uh, when doing that sort of analysis? So, Brad, your perspective? Yeah, I'll just uh, say a few basic things here. And I've written some papers with Richard Gerger, which are available, I think, through the uh, through the length of, of our program, which would go into more detail. But let me just hit a couple high points. The first thing is discount rates are critical to valuation. And discount rates start with a risk-free rate. And the risk-free rate tends to incorporate, at least eventually, expected inflation. And if you're typically doing a valuation, you're using a long-term risk-free rate, like a 20-year government. A 20-year government will incorporate 20-year inflationary expectations. So when you turn to the numerator, the things that you're projecting, you have to be careful that the projections there are consistent with the denominator. I've seen people use interest rates to discount, but then not put the expected inflation in the numerator. And that's going to lead to a very significant uh, problem. Uh, a second thing to keep your eye on is the difference between capital expenditures and depreciation. And let me take a simple case where the company is just replacing old equipment, no growth. Even with no growth, current capital expenditures will be greater than depreciation because depreciation is based on things purchased at earlier days at lower prices. So even if you have a stable, steady state, no growth model, you're going to have to have CapEx be greater than, uh, than uh, depreciation. And if you're going forward, then it depends not on historical 
inflation, which is what affects the relation of current CapEx to depreciation, but future expected inflation. So you can th- see these things get, get really tricky. Here's one that, that Mr. Gerger and I find people trip up on all the time. They try to incorporate growth in their model. And they say that growth equals the, re- the money you retain, the retained earnings, times uh, the return on invested capital. In other words, no retained earnings, no growth. That's true in real terms, but it's not true in nominal terms. In nominal terms, your invested capital is going to be growing because you're, uh, of the impact of inflation. So you're going to have nominal growth even if you have no real growth. And people trip up on that all the time. And the final thing I'd like to point to, just to, to get your thinking going, is more and more of the value of, of modern companies is coming from intangibles that don't enter the balance sheet. If you look at uh, Google, for example, about 80% of its value doesn't appear on its balance sheet. It's the intangible capital with its software, its know-how, its organized labor force, and so forth. You've got to be really careful that if you have an inflationary environment, how inflation is going to affect those intangible assets that don't even appear. So really all I've been able to do for you this morning or this afternoon or evening, wherever you are, is key up some of the questions. And maybe Carla will speak and and Patrick and, and, and Alexander to these things. But I want to underline that dealing with the decline in the value of the unit of account, if it's running at 5% or more is absolutely critical. It is not something that can be ignored. Thanks, thanks, Brad. And, and if I may add to that, uh, one of the things it, it, that people really need to think about in nominal terms, if you're not going to do your valuation in real terms, is that uh, a lot of times people use rules of thumb. They're used to saying the long-term growth rate for this business is X percent. And the X percent a lot of times is whatever they think in their country is the typical number. And what I would challenge is, or at least to let people think about is that that growth rate, and it should be like a nominal number, right? It's not a re, it's not, unless you're doing real valuation. And so that nominal number means that in an environment where inflation was really low, maybe it was okay to use whatever you, without making a lot of changes, but you have to think about uh, how that long-term growth rate might change, but at the same time, think about how that impacts the WAC. And so with that, I'm actually going to touch a little bit. I, I saw a number of questions on, on, on the WAC and how, and, and Brett actually mentioned exactly that, you know, there's an element of inflation embedded in your cost of capital. So let's, let's look at that um, for a little bit. So, it, this is just a very simplified version, just to set the stage of saying, like, where could inflation impact the discount rate? And and this is, I'm assuming, no size effect, so to simplify, but I am thinking about a country risk premium, and why is that? A lot of times, uh, countries in the emerging market world don't really have, number one, a risk-free rate. The, even if the local government issues some debt and it's publicly traded, a lot of times those countries are risky. So there's a certain default spread included in those numbers. So they're not truly really risk, risk free. So a lot of times, and this is why, you know, like a lot, of, I would recommend our project teams to do across the globe is that for many jurisdictions, perhaps starting with the mature market currency instead and then adjust for country risk to the extent that that's not being reflected in the cash flows, uh, to take that component of, um, you know, separately and start with true risk-free rates. And it, we tend to think of true risk-free rates for countries that are AAA rated uh, by uh, the major uh, rating agencies, or maybe, you know, you could think about maybe like double ray rated, but not something uh, much lower, because that's not going to be risk-free. So uh, the... That's an area, the risk free rate, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, that could be impacted by inflation. Equity risk premium could also be impacted in the following sense. Brad mentioned um, the inflation risk premium. In other words, the, the risk that inflation 
turns out to be different from what was expected. And that incremental risk, if you think that your cash flows are more variable um, and you haven't really reflected, a, a, you know, so you may try to reflect them in uh, projections with scenarios, but there may be a wider variability around the cash flows that a company has than in the past. And if investors think that's the case, you could see potentially an increase in that extra premium demanded for to invest in capital. And I will also uh, show you some data on country risk premium and how that, how that could be impacted. Uh, on the debt side, uh, we, the debt side, if you think about it, it's comprised of like you start first with that risk-free rate plus the corporate default spread. And that corporate default spread, based on history, when interest rates are higher, the spreads actually tend to widen. So it's not a one-for-one one increase. So you could see, start seeing a, an increase in cost of debt, not just because of the risk-free rate going up, but also of this widening of default spreads. And then, I, as I said, I'll talk about the, risk free, uh, the country risk adjustments in a sec. So um, to the risk-free rate, this is like the, you know, the, the fundamental starting point. Like this is where you start. And if you go to like the, the, uh, the work by Irving Fisher from like the 1930s already, would tell us that a nominal risk-free rate is comprised of a real rate component and the expected inflation. It's not historical inflation. And if you're doing a long-term valuation or valuation in perpetuity and you're using a single whack, it's also not the inflation next year or two years from now. It should be over the long term. So you should be expecting to see some some um, reflection of this num, you know, of the risk-free rate going up because of that. And that's some of the data that I showed earlier in the beginning, for example, for long-term inflation for some countries. There's also an element that is not here, this is a simplified version, which is that inflation risk premium that Brad mentioned, which um, if inflation tends to be low, you know, academics have said it's, it could be like positive or negative, sometimes close to zero. But one thing that may not be zero is in this environment, if inflation persists, that, that it's unexpected elements would add some risk premium to, to this equation. Um, the other, this is just like a little, you know, the reason why I keep showing some of the data for a developed markets market is that, as I said, a lot of times you start with a developed market or a mature currency um, to, to, as your starting point and then make adjustments for country risk. Um, and here, the, the key um, for this is like, interest rates for like the 10-year government bond deals for these countries collapsed to their record lows during COVID. Germany had uh, already seen it in 2019, but we're seeing an increase in this. And part of that is still not fully like inf it's inflation expectations, but it's also the fact that central banks around the world, in the, or at least in the major developed markets, are starting to raise their policy rates. The U.S. in particular sometimes it's called the central bank of the world and they their interest rates have uh, an impact in the, the entire environment we see globally and so when the federal reserve bank the fed is saying that not only they're going to use the you know their short-term policy rates going to go up but from a perspective of long-term rates the fact that they might start quantitative tightening so if they start selling their huge balance sheet that it's like a nine trillion dollars trillion with a t um, selling some of their securities, that could have an impact on longer term rates. And that in turn would impact uh, interest rates around the globe. Um, and so this is where we could see that impact. So what we've seen from data is that, it's, you know, the incremental risk, and this is measured using this model, the sovereign yield spread. So what is the incremental uh, yield in, you know, in a given country that issues the dollar, um, the dominated debt versus the U.S. Treasury with the same maturity. And so that incremental risk tends to rise in periods of uh, financial um, dislocation. But, as, but in this case, we may start seeing, this data is only updated through March, we may start seeing some widening of these spreads. Um, also partly due to inflation. So um, remember, this is a spread. So if uh, not, not the actual uh, 
you know, interest rate. And so in Europe, we saw already a little bit, we're not back to uh, COVID uh, periods, um, but it has, uh, it, it had been coming down and now we're seeing it raise, uh, rising up, for example, in Africa, and we may see this rise even further. So investing in emerging markets may become riskier. And this is another uh, perspective for Latin America and the Middle East. And, and fi again, we're not back to that, those levels of COVID because COVID was a significant global risk event. And, uh, and then Asia Pacific, we're also starting to see some, some increase. So this is something to monitor, to start seeing where these spreads are going, but that should be something that could increase uh, inv uh, risk inv of investments in emerging markets and frontier markets. So with that, um, I'm going to ask um, Alex to take a perspective now from the income approach to the market approach. So what is the impact of inflation when you're computing uh, market or trading multiples? And so some of the things that you uh, are, need to take into consideration and be careful when you're comparing like companies with your peers, for example, what are some of the um, analytical adjustments you make or things that you are concerned about when you're doing this analysis? Thank you, Carla. First, I, I would start the, the answer saying about how uh, strength uh, and how much effort we have to locally put on a, a particular company analysis and DCF approach. Right. So ha having said that, then we can change for, for the market approach that is, and I would say it is the volatile market that we have today, right? It's even uh, more relevant, the, the comment about using the multiples. I, I would say the main thing that we need to worry when doing the market approach here in, in the region uh, is uh, it's, it's just the base, right? So if you see the companies that uh, they are with growth perspectives that are different in different sectors, right? Even when you put in the peer, we have in the region companies in different phases of growth. So we do have to consider when you go to the, the market approach, I would say uh, the, 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 where the company is and if it's truly comparable with another company. Just to give another example that's not inflation related, but affects directly my comment is about fiscal incentives and tax incentives that you have in the region, right? Companies similar in the same sector, one may have, another may have not. So you cannot apply the same multiple uh, uh, on EBITDA multiple basis, for instance, or cash flow, if you do not consider this, this difference. So I would take this example to, to explore the inflation one, right? And also if the companies and the operations are really comparable. So that's why you, and, uh, when we analyze, we put much more preference on the scope of cash flow. Of course, we have to analyze the, the trading multiples. When you have some international exposure of these companies, it's, I would say, easier for doing that, right? It makes much more sense. Uh, but I would say in terms of putting the companies in the same pace in terms of generating the results, in terms of the phase of the company and it's the specific conditions that every company in Latin America has. And this you have to differentiate Latin America. Argentina is Argentina, Brazil is Brazil, and Colombia is Colombia, and Mexico is Mexico in terms of tax structure, in terms of how the inflation affects the country, how the currency and the foreign exchange rate affects. So uh, uh, going short to your answer, uh, Carla, I, I would say that you have to be, take very cautious when you approach only uh, a market uh, approach to value the companies. And just as a final comment on that, I believe it's important, uh, and Professor Brad mentioned this uh, briefly, and I would emphasize is about if the inflation is four or five or six percent, it can be eventually marginal, nothing is marginal in numbers, right? But can be small in one year, but when you compound it, in a two or three years effect, it's a very relevant issue. And you can go and lead these two problems when even making the valuations on a market approach. Thanks, Alex. And uh, it, it just uh, shows you that you can really get it wrong if you're not careful. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. I was going to ask for um, 
the next polling question before we talk a little bit about um, hyperinflationary env environments and what we think about uh, some of the accounting issues that we should be aware of. So uh, our last polling question, oh, um, I'm sorry, actually, it's not all a polling question. It's like the, what is the primary purpose of your valuations? Uh, is financial reporting, tax, litigation, fairness opinions, or are they not applicable? And then I'll, I'll ask the fourth <laughs> polling question. I apologize. And we seem like uh, over half of the folks on the audience are doing this for financial reporting purposes, but we still have other not applicable and and a variety of the other purposes. And the final polling question that I wanted to also ask um, the audience uh, their opinion, and this is a little bit more elaborate and, and select all that apply. Um, so the recovery from COVID-19 pandemic has led to a surge in inflation. In which areas does the high inflation create additional challenges when you are performing evaluation or you're reviewing evaluation? So what are some of these uh, issues? Is it estimating revenue growth, assessing trends in cost increases and operating margins? Is it estimating cap capex and investment needs? Uh, selecting long-term growth rates in a terminal year, incorporating higher inflation in cost of capital, or you don't think there are additional issues because you're already dealing with these issues prior to the pandemic, uh, if you're like an emerging market or other not applicable. So if you could um, select uh, all that apply, and hopefully we could actually share this after the, um, um, after the webinar and post it on the IVSU website, just to give like a sense of where valuation professionals and reviewers are struggling in terms of you know, the impact of inflation in valuation. Okay, and so this is, okay, incorporating higher inflation in the cost of capital seems, and assessing trends in cost increases seems to be like up there, but very close to estimating revenue growth and even the long-term growth rate. So, so these are like all issues that professionals are dealing with. So I think this is great to know uh, in terms of what are some of the things we need to, to talk about. I'm sorry, Alex, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I just, if you can put the poll, Carla, uh, uh, again, just make one comment from a Latin American guy and Patrick can also probably comment. O -o my view is why assessing trends in cost increase and operating margins is the most relevant one. Because there is a point you can probably pick up all the effects, right? I would much more on cost and margins than revenues. So this is interesting, for, as I said, living here, right? <laughs> and doing this all the time. You have some, some uh, points that you can pick all the effects. And I would say, and when I was reading the question, I said, I would touch this one as the main one. And in fact, was the main one, because here you can pick up all the operational and inflationary effects. So that's very interesting to have this answer because puts, we are on the same page, I would say, saying, where is the tricky point where you can get the problems? Sorry for, for making the comment, but it was interesting. No. Alex, that's, that's great. And I think that's, um, you know, because it's not clear, by the way, that inflation is always going to be uh, lowering the value of a company. So there are some industries and some companies that will actually will benefit from having higher prices. And, and some of the companies that have uh, very competitive advantages in their respective markets might be able to pass on those cost increases and not see like a, a, a margin um you know, depression, if you will, yep. as a result of inflation, while others will definitely be very impacted by, by those issues and may not be able to pass on all of the, their raw materials and operating cost increases, and then they'll see like a margin compression. So it's not clear, and this is why it's a challenge for valuation, it's not clear that it will always be a detriment to value. Some companies may be benefiting. Um, I know that Brett also had a comment on this topic. Uh, do you want to? Hand. Yes, and it is related to what you and Alex were saying. Just very briefly, inflation can lead to confusion between inflationary price in, uh, increases and relative price increases. For example, the war in the Ukraine is going to cause the price of oil and gas to rise relative to other goods and services. But does it have to cause the price of all goods and services to rise, which is inflation? And that goes right back to businesses. They have to be clear on, am I raising my price because I think I can charge more relative to other things or am I just matching inflation? Yeah, that's excellent. 
Um, so um, I am going to uh, now ask Patrick from a perspective of hyperinflationary uh, trends. And then if we have like a couple of minutes at the end, I might address it one more or two questions from the Q&A. But Patrick, uh, so what do we have to be worried about when we're looking at a company's financial statements? And then from financial reporting perspective, because we are using financial reporting numbers, right, as a starting point for our valuation. And so when does a company get classified as hyperinflationary? And so what are some of the unique considerations, say, for IFRS filers that um, help us identify what's the exposure of an overall company to these hyperinflationary uh, economies? And are there, like, metrics that are, like, um, internally inconsistent, so something at historical cost versus something that is updated to current market values, what are some of those challenges that we, we have to deal with? Thanks, Carla, for that. So first of all, uh, on how to classify an economy, whether it's hyperinflationary or not, from an IFRS perspective, it is a bit judgmental on how to determine when restatement for hyperinflation becomes necessary. Hyperinflation is indicated by characteristics of an economy, which include, but is not limited to, a following, uh, the following characteristics. So we can witness that the general population prefers to keep its wealth in non-monetary assets or in a relatively stable foreign currency amounts of local currency held uh, or invested immediately to maintain purchasing power. Another factor is that the general population regards monetary amounts not in terms of the local currency, but in terms of a relatively stable currency. That's because of the fluctuation of the exchange rate of the local currency. A third factor is sales and purchases on credit take place at prices that compensate for the expected loss of purchasing power during the credit period, even if the period is short. Last but not least, the cumulative inflation rate over three years is approaching or exceeds 100%. So although the 100% numerical indicator is a key factor in identifying hyperinflation, it is not the only factor and should not be considered in isolation. So applying all of these factors could result in a country being considered hyperinflationary when its three-year cumulative inflation rate is, for example, only 80%, but we've already witnessed all the other factors. So although uh, judgment is involved in determining the onset of hyperinflation in a particular case, a, preferent, a preference is stated in the standard in IS 29 for all affected entities to apply the standard from the same date. So in practice, what happens is that other large networks uh, just communicate locally that all these factors are witnessed. They channel this to their international uh, technical desks who agree that at a certain point in time, uh, we should declare that this economy is a hyperinflationary economy. And for all FRS reporters who has an X local currency as a functional currency, hyperinflation accounting should be applied. So this takes us to the step after we determined that an economy is hyperinflationary. So when an entity's functional currency is hyperinflationary, or is the currency of a hyperinflationary economy, its financial statements are restated so that all items are presented in the measuring unit current at reporting date. So it adopts the current purchasing power concept. Moreover, when an entity has foreign operations, so uh, in a country whose functional currency is the currency of a hyperinflationary economy as well, the investee's financial statements are restated before being translated and included in the investor's financial statements. So basically, for Lebanon, for example, which is a hyperinflationary economy, all local entities who has LBP, the Lebanese Lira, as a functional currency should apply IS-29. And on the other hand, for groups who has a foreign operation in Lebanon, and this foreign operation has a functional currency of LBP as well, they should apply on a group perspective, IS-29. That, how is that done? That's simply done by applying locally for the Lebanese subsidiary IS-29 and then consolidating on that basis. So to get into a bit of that with the last two minutes that we have on how that's applied. 
So we should apply the four-step model, basically, to prepare these financial statements. And the four steps are concluded as step one, restate the statement of financial position at the beginning of the reporting period, then restate the statement of financial position at the end of the reporting period. Step three, restate the statement of profit uh, or loss and OCI. And step four, calculate separately and disclose the gain or loss on net monetary position. So the main considerations in the exercise are indexing up using the percentage increase of CPI and treating monetary or non-monetary amounts differently. So after classifying monetary or non-monetary uh, balances or items, then we should treat that as such. I'll give a quick example for how we index up a fixed asset and then we can probably conclude. So I, uh, as an entity in Lebanon, for example, I have purchased a property back in 2010. So what the standard says is that you index up that non-monetary asset, this property, back from the last date of purchase, acquisition or valuation. So if the acquisition date was in 2010 and there was no subsequent valuation, what I do is that I get the exact CPI back in 2010, compare it to 2022, supposedly CPI, if I'm reporting for 2022, or the reporting date CPI, the percentage increase between the two CPIs is the increase that's applicable on the non-monetary asset. So I debit that asset for the amount or increase in CPI, and I accredit again on monetary position, which is the offsetting uh, amount in any IS-29 exercise. And this line item is a new line item that is presented in PNL. So that, in a nutshell, is a bit of how the mechanics of IS-29 work. And Patrick, very quickly, would any of these create any valuation opportunities for like either fixed assets, real estate, or, or, or in, intangibles when you like translate, you try to restate these items, it, or, or you think this is just a very mechanical accounting? It exercise? is a very mechanical, but usually the economics impose this requirement rather than IS-29 imposing it. So IS-29 okay. has no specific requirement to apply a valuation, but uh, rather the economics and the situation in the country would impose similar valuations, as you rightly mentioned. All right. Well, thank you very much. We're at the top of the hour. There were some uh, additional questions. A lot of them are related to um, cost of capital. Uh, you know, Richard has said that because there are so many good questions in there that maybe the IVFC will collate some perspective paper on these questions. Um, and, 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 and so more, more to come on this. And I, just to reiterate, the webinar will be posted uh, on the IDSC webinar for those of you who still wanted to re-listen. And I'm not, I, we haven't been able to listen to everything, um, I, I mean, or talk about all the issues. This is a complex issue. We could not give it due justice in one hour, but we hope it was helpful.